Hello and welcome to PTI's educational webinar mini-series. Today we're going to be talking about experimental design and statistical analysis as it relates to a pass-fail inspection test method. So we'll review some uh, sample sets, how to deal with that, uh, quantities that you may want to include as part of your, your experimental design, how to set that experimental design up, and how to assess the data after you collect the data. So experimental design, it very much depends on what it is that you're looking to do, whether you're validating the system or you're establishing a test method. If we're establishing a test method, how we lay out the sample sets and what we want included in that testing is going to be very different. So uh, when we're establishing a test method, we typically want at least uh, 50 or 100 samples uh, of which we have a population of defects as well included in that and you know where the, the, the good samples are and the defects, you have them controlled. So uh, in that experimental design, we're really just isolating uh, some of the input factors or control variables, and uh, we're creating that population of uh, good samples, defective samples, and we're gonna collect that data independently and compare that data. Whereas if we're validating the method, uh, you typically would wanna have a randomized sample set and uh, how you would control those uh, um, the data at the end, it, it's the, the test results will identify what is good and bad. So how you laid out that experimental design very much depends on what your goal is with the data. Throughout this experiment and any experiment, we want to control as much of the influencing variables. So the, the more control you have of control variables and the more we can eliminate uh, in, outside influencing variables, the better data we can have. So really, uh, that also gets down to the quality of the technology and the test method. The quality of that test measurement is at the very foundation of the results you produce. So the ideal sample sets, we're again uh, setting up a test method so you have two known sample sets, known good samples and known defective samples. So the known good samples or negative controls, uh, this is a population we assume are good. So how do we really know they are good? Uh, you can uh, pre-qualify the samples using non-destructive methods, or you can also use a method of identifying the outliers and removing them from your sample set. Those outliers, you always want to keep them. They're extremely valuable. Uh, those outliers could be your naturally occurring defects that you're uh, so interested in finding. So uh, outliers are certainly very important to, to uh, keep a hold of. You can also use gold standards or a master sample to uh, add as a, sort of a reference value with negative controls. But regardless, you have that population of negative controls and you can clean it of any outliers so that you, you know that that sample set is representative of the population. And then the defects that we use for that experimental design, you may be using uh, NIST traceable standards such as a flow meter as one type of defect. We may also use laser drill defects, which would be a certified leak size. So these are ways that you can really control the type of defect that you're introducing into the test, and you can better control the, those test results so that we can understand them better. Uh, another approach is you can create a crack defect, but those are far more dynamic, and you have to then reference that against another standard, which could be that NIST flow meter. When we're uh, gathering our sample sets, just be very sure to, to capture all the essential variability from your day-to-day -day production line. If you're grabbing all the samples from a single lot, then that may not be ideal in establishing your test method because you, you just won't get that natural variability that we're looking for. So with leak testing, standard deviation is uh, definitely a, a very valuable tool. Uh, we're collecting data and we're comparing good samples to defective samples. The standard deviation is one of the greatest tools to compare different populations to one another and to uh, really understand how a single population uh, exists. So uh, quickly, standard deviation is just a measurement of dispersion of the samples, of, of the data. And it goes by the, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, which is within one standard deviation of the mean, plus or minus one standard deviation, you have 68% of the population. Uh, 
within two standard deviations, deviations plus or minus from the mean, you have 95% of the population in that range, and so on and so forth. And as uh, you go to uh, three and four standard deviations away, that uh, percentage that resides outside of that area is very, very small. And I'll tell you why that's important uh, in a short while. So uh, when we're ca calculating the standard deviation, we want at least 30 good samples in that population to accurately calculate the standard deviation. Anything less, and you're making an assumption about the standard deviation of that population. And we don't want to make any assumptions at this time. So standard deviation is very important because we're using it to compare two populations, one to the other. Now we also mentioned outliers earlier. Uh, we, we need to understand how to calculate for outliers when we're evaluating the population of known good samples or the negative controls. And uh, really the way that you calculate an outlier, so if you're collecting data and you see these little blips that uh, certainly stand out from the crowd, you would want to understand, do they really belong in that population of known good samples? And so you can calculate outliers by calculating the interquartile range. So you have to uh, align the population in by um, size or, or quantity, by number, and you're going to get the median. You can also get the interquartile range, which is the range from Q1 to Q3. And then you take that interquartile range and you multiply it by 1.5. So this is the interquartile range. You multiply it by 1.5 and then uh, Q1 minus that area gives you the lower range for setting an outlier boundary and uh, the upper fence. So uh, the third quartile plus that 1.5 times the interquartile range and that gives us our fences. Any numbers outside of that you don't want to include as part of your known good sample population. Those are outliers. There's something funny about those samples. So just keep that in mind and um, as we're as you're setting up your, your sample set and population. So again, with leak testing, we're, we're always comparing two distinct populations, one population of known good samples and then a population of samples that should be defective. They're somehow different. And so you can see that if you include a, uh, a test result with a traceable flow meter, you get a higher result. And the greater the airflow that is Put into that test chamber, you get an even higher result. So defects will produce a higher number and they will be outside this normal distribution of good samples. So any inspection method, that's really what's happening. You have a population of samples that you say, this should be good, these are good, and we have to identify those that reside outside of that, that range. Now what you'll also find is that defects are more dynamic, they will have a greater range in that population, so it's just something to pay attention to. So with that, uh, when we're doing a, a population distribution and understanding how the good samples are, one way you can visualize it is by turning that bell curve on its side, and that's really what represents or uh, describes that quantitative test result for good samples. And then the idea is that defects need to be far enough to one end of that curve for us to detect them, for them to be out of range. Because this is uh, a, a test where the defects produce a higher result and uh, no other, we really only care about the single end of this bell curve and the single tail of that, uh, that population. So as long as uh, you know, we are calculating this data, we really only care about this upper limit. And the goal here in the pharmaceutical industry is that one defect per 10,000 is what's critical. And we'll get back to that number in a, in a short while, but one in 10,000 really is dictated by a four standard deviation separation from the mean. So if we go four standard deviations up and put a pass fail limit there, that's where you will see only one in 10,000 false rejects. So let's talk about something called signal noise ratio. It's a great way to describe what it is that we're doing within inspection. And so the, the noise, we describe that as three times the standard deviation. And the signal is the result that we get from a defective sample, the difference between that result and the average good samples. So this difference between the average of good samples and that defective result, that's our signal. That's what we hope to detect.
and the signal noise ratio, the greater that ratio is, the higher the signal is compared to the variation in good samples, the more capable we are at detecting that defect. Now, this is how we calculate signal noise ratio. Again, it's the difference between that test result from a defect and the average result of good samples. And you divide that by three times the standard deviation of the good samples. And uh, because, you know, that, that result, it, you know, the signal noise ratio, it, it captures standard deviation. It looks at the difference between those two populations. It really encompasses everything that we need to achieve in an inspection method. <clears throat> now recall, we're, we're trying to uh, discern the difference between the population of good samples and defective samples. And so if we go to four standard deviations, what that eventually comes out to is that you will have only uh, one in 10,000 known good samples will pass. It's actually closer to one in 15,000. And we're just looking again at this single tail of the, the distribution. So if we draw a pass element at four standard deviations to the right of your good samples, you will only have one in 10,000 uh, good samples that will be indicated as defective. So really what that uh, also comes down to is if we have a signal noise ratio of 1.33, which indicates a four standard deviation separation from the mean, we have a one in 10,000 chance that you would reject a good sample. So all these numbers are really important because again, we're trying to separate and uh, quantitatively identify defects from good samples. So to do that, we want those two populations to be as distinctly separate as possible. So to set a pass-fail limit, the optimal uh, place to drop a pass-fail limit is going to be uh, four standard deviations to the right of the mean and somewhere between that and the lower limit of where we see defective samples producing a result. Now recall that the defective samples, they are a more widely dispersed population. So setting this lower limit for the defective samples is more challenging, but this allows us to uh, really get a range to set the pass fail limits. And here we balance the risk of having false positives and false negatives. That's the optimal zone to set your pass fail limit. So in summary, the uh, statistics are an interpretive tool. They support us in analyzing the data that we produce, but it all starts with quality inputs. So the better the inputs we have into our experiment, the better that exper experimental design, all of these things factor into good quality data and having uh, a, a data set that we can apply good statistical tools to interpret. And at the very base of it all is the inspection technology. If you have a good, reliable test measure of any uh, test result, so if the sensory technology is reliable and produces repeatable data, that's at the foundation of any experimental design, any data work that you do. So be sure that your inspection technology is of the most reliable and sensitive in producing its test data. So with that, I thank you for joining us today and please look for many more webinars to come.